Humans often cope with death by disguising it as life. Perhaps the most glaring example of this is the open casket funeral, when humans go through the effort of dressing up a dead person and laying them in a giant jewelry box with plush lining, almost creating the impression that they're sleeping. It's just an open coffin. Can't believe they just leave it out here like this. George, it's awake! Awake? No. Brenda! It's George, a miracle! Oh. I thought you were dead! However, as time passes, that sleeping beauty will undergo some drastic changes. Here's how your body might change after a year of eternal beauty sleep. Death waits for no one, and it certainly won't wait for a corpse to get gussied up before your body starts to break down. The first organ to go is your brain. After spending its whole life trying to keep the rest of you alive, in death your brain does the same thing in much more dramatic fashion. As detailed in the book What We Leave Behind, your brain cells will start breaking themselves down in a process called autolysis. This begins after just four minutes of oxygen deprivation. According to Scientific American, during autolysis, carbon dioxide ruptures your cells, which in turn release nutrients that fuel bacteria and fungi. It's these organisms that help liquefy the brain. Of course, the timing of all this depends on temperature. Cold temperatures delay the onset of autolysis, which is the reason why people who have drowned in freezing water can sometimes be resuscitated. What we leave behind observes that in this scenario, your brain goes into a hibernal state instead of outright dying. So, theoretically, if your brain had thought of doing this in warmer temperatures, it would have stayed alive longer, giving you a chance to survive, too. However, once a human brain finally turns out the lights, things will start getting pretty funky. As Business Insider describes it, the fluid in your brain cells will leak into a puddle all over your final resting place. So keep that in mind before you spend thousands of dollars on a top-of-the-line casket. The lid is titanium steel. It's lined with mink fur, and it comes with free Wi-Fi. It's what Pop-Up would have wanted. Moving on from the brain, let's get inside what's happening to the rest of your body. The bacteria that typically aid in digesting food start feasting on the only thing that it has left to eat — you. Hours into the process, they will eventually chow down on your gallbladder, unleashing a yellow-green bile through your body, altering its hue. As hours turn into days, your body will start swelling and releasing some horrible substances. According to Scientific American, your corpse will emit a bewildering array of more than 400 chemicals and gases. And, as you might have guessed, anyone within sniffing distance should use any means available to avoid inhaling these fumes. About three or four months into the process, your blood cells start hemorrhaging iron, turning your body brownish-black. Soon, your cells lose their structure, causing your tissues to become a watery mush. After a little more than a year, your clothes will decompose because of exposure to the various chemicals your corpse produced. And like that, you've gone from being a sleeping beauty wearing your most beautiful ensemble to a naked mush of decomposing toxic goo. No matter how peaceful your death is, you'll never have the chance to rest in one piece, and this is thanks to the disgusting magic of decomposition. But under certain circumstances, particularly if your coffin is kept above ground in a mausoleum, the rest of your pieces could be flung everywhere as your corpse explodes in a horrific blaze of glory. Josh Slocum, executive director of Funeral Consumers Alliance, explained to Vice that the casket becomes a literal pressure cooker. It reduces the body to a disgusting, chunky brown slurry. And when that pressure reaches the coffin's tipping point, you have corpse juice spilling out all over the place. Slocum noted that there have been cases where this pressure is actually powerful enough to blow that little square off the front of a crypt. Slocum likened it to leaving a Tupperware container full of meat in your fridge for too long. After all, at the end of your life, you're basically just a giant meal for hungry microbes. Of course, if you don't want to slowly rot away like a rancid sandwich, there's always another option. <laughs> I do have this coupon for a cremation. Anyone who keeps up with the news likely knows about the implosion of Ocean Gate's Titan submersible by now. But what actually happened to the people inside? The details are pretty gruesome. Five people died in the vessel's destruction. Ocean Gate CEO Stockton Rush, owner of Action Aviation Hamish Harding, Pakistani businessman Shahzada Dawood, his son Suleiman Dawood, and French explorer Paul-Henri Nargelet. The implosion occurred sometime after the Titan descended into the Atlantic Ocean to visit the wreckage of the Titanic on Sunday, June 18, 2023. Coast Guard Rear Admiral John Mauger explained that an unmanned vehicle found debris from the Titan, including its tail end, about 1,600 feet from the bow of the Titanic. The debris is consistent with the catastrophic loss of the pressure chamber. 
The pieces of the Titan sit about 12,500 feet below the surface. That's deeper than nine Empire State Buildings stacked on top of each other. At that depth, water pressure crushes the entire human body, except for the bones, and crumples vessels with any crack or defect. If a submersible implodes into a human body, there's not much chance of finding any remains, ecologist Nikolai Roderman explained to NBC News. The deceased would have died instantly and known nothing as their bodies were subjected to pressure equal to the weight of the Eiffel Tower. The sea pressure is 380 times the pressure uh, on land. Anyone who has ever dove to the bottom of a pool or taken part in scuba diving can attest to feeling the pressure underwater. Even at shallow depths, you can feel the difference in your lungs, your head, your ears, and elsewhere. Dive Deep Scuba explains that the limit for recreational, non-beginner scuba diving without a special deep diving suit is about 130 feet, about one hundredth of the depth of the Titan. Go lower and you'll suffer decompression sickness when returning to the surface, also known as the bends. This condition results in headaches, dizziness, numbness, joint pain, an inability to concentrate, and more. According to Scientific American, for every 33 feet of depth underwater, the pressure on an object increases by 15 pounds per square inch, or PSI. Sunlight cuts out at 656 feet deep, at around 298 PSI. Rottweiler bites equal 328 PSI, Ruffle Snuffle notes, while crocodile bites measure up to 3,700 PSI. A great white shark can bite up to 4,000 PSI. Where the Titanic rests underwater, pressure pushes in at an unbearable 5,500 to 6,000 PSI. All of that pressure was pushing on the Titan when it imploded, as well as each of the people inside, on every single square inch of their bodies, all at once. NBC News calls that equivalent to up to 10,000 tons pressing against them. A 2009 Mythbusters episode demonstrated what happens to a human body subjected to deep-sea diving pressure high enough to cause an implosion. The experiment saw a human-shaped dummy made of pig parts with bones, muscle, fat, skin, and midsection of guts stuffed into a deep-sea diving suit. What results is a popping, spurting mass of red flooding the diving helmet as the dummy suit is depressurized. That is absolutely confirmed, no doubt about it. Needless to say, no one could survive such pressure, and that dummy was only 300 feet deep. The Titan was at more than 40 times that depth. Blair Thornton, a professor of marine autonomy at the University of Southampton, told NBC News that it wouldn't take some large visible crack to make a submersible implode at the depths of the Titanic. It would only take minuscule or even microscopic defects. The air inside would compress down to a point, and the forces of the water rushing in and the collapse would be enormous. He added that it would be as if the crew winked away in the blink of an eyelid. That means those on board likely didn't even know what happened, nor did they suffer. Such statements, however, are unlikely to provide comfort to the victim's loved ones. Though death is a fundamental part of life, it's something that modern society has mostly kept out of sight and out of mind. People pass away and are passed along. They're covered in sheets and kept out of sight until morticians beautify them for their final public reveal. Then the casket is closed and that enclosure is literally stuffed into the ground and left impossible to access. Because of our increasing distance from the reality of death, though, people are left with plenty of curiosity, discussions, and speculation about what happens to the body after death. Does the body putrefy into a mass of watery substances, or does it desiccate like a mummy? What about mausoleums, or types of coffin wood, or a steel vault, or methods of embalming? Do the deceased's health and age factors matter? Could you transform into a bog person like Tallinn Man in Denmark if only you sink into a peat bog at the moment of death? Could your body in fact absorb some crazy fungus and become an honest-to-goodness antagonist of the living in the zombie apocalypse? The possibilities are enough to keep anyone up at night. I mean, one minute you're in bed with a knockout gal or guy, and the next you're a compost heap. Well, doesn't that bother any of you because it scares the living piss out of me? Well, we're here to put your mind at ease by removing the doubt and telling you exactly what terrible things are going to happen to your corpse once you inevitably die. There are a lot of factors that contribute to the state of a body. Certain biological facts, though, let us create a glass window in the lid of a casket to see what would happen to your body after 10 years, excluding certain exceptions like mummification, which involves removing the organs, and barring environmental factors. A wet environment will hasten decay and a dry environment will slow decay, for example. The first thing to know is that the most dramatic decay happens within the first month, so the difference between a body at a month after death and 10 years isn't actually all that much. 
For bodies that aren't cremated, there's a specific pattern of events that typically happens in the United States. First, the recently deceased pass along to autopsy techs, who may or may not extract all of a person's organs. After this, a sutured body is passed along to an embalmer, who undoes the stitches, replaces the organs, and injects a mixture of embalming fluid called cavity fluid into various vessels. A sealant is placed over the sutures to prevent leakage, and sometimes plastic and powder are placed over the body as well. This is all before the mortician applies makeup, trims nails, and dresses the dead for burial. During this entire time, the body is undergoing decay that influences what it looks like 10 years down the line. Within three days after death, in fact, the body undergoes autolysis, when bodily enzymes eat their own cells. Blood pools in parts of the body closest to the ground. Rigor mortis occurs and skin gets loose. And the abdomen? Generally, it turns lime green. After initial autolysis, the body bloats, exudes foul-smelling gases, and releases fluid from the mouth and nose, which, according to National Geographic, may be the inspiration for ancient vampire myths. This occurs three to five days after death, then explains why wakes are typically held right away. Then the decay begins to slow down. From eight days on, skin recedes from fingernails, bodies start to look less human and more like decaying corpses, and flesh begins to decompose, with cartilage bones and hair staying intact much longer than muscles and organs. With no coffin or embalming, a body in the ground in nature takes eight to ten years to totally decompose. If there is a coffin or embalming, the timeline is prolonged. Decay sets in sooner in a wooden casket rather than a metal casket, but sealing a casket can help keep out moisture and bacteria. On the other hand, this can cause caskets to pressurize as decomposing bodies release gas. According to trusted caskets, wooden caskets can distort in shape and even explode underground. As you can imagine, this definitely won't help preserve the body, unless it somehow launches the corpse straight into the afterlife. Coffins, just like people, eventually decay and return to the soil. Long before then, though, the bodies inside them will largely be gone. Ultimately, from one month on, we all more or less liquefy at a similar rate. Within 10 years, teeth, bones, and maybe skin or sinew are all that are left. You know what they say, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. According to PBS, the chances of an average American dying in a plane crash are 1 in 11 million. In comparison, it's much more common to die in a car crash or even from drowning. The number of fatal plane crashes has dropped significantly in the last few decades, and even more so with the 2020 pandemic, due to the decrease in international travel. According to the National Safety Council, commercial air travel is one of the safest modes of transportation. Nonetheless, plane crashes occasionally do happen. According to Ranker, 95% of people who crash while on a plane survive. However, if the plane crash proves fatal for those on board, the bodies are grievously injured along the way. So much so that it makes cataloging the injuries incredibly difficult. Some of these injuries might include disintegration, dismemberment, and detachment of the skin. Moreover, major lacerations and crushing can occur as well. Factors including speed, size, and the site of the crash determine what will remain of the body although often a large number of body parts are missing. Sometimes the remains are found far from the rest of the plane. If decompression occurs when a plane falls apart in the air, it can suck out bodies and seats outside, thus making them difficult to find. As horrifying as this sounds, the suffering for those who die in plane crashes is astonishingly minimal. It's likely that passengers wouldn't even know they're crashing. If the crash is sudden, the passenger would only be conscious for a moment or two. And when we hit the ground, I got knocked out. Moreover, the human body is not designed to withstand high deceleration forces, which is why the body suffers such brutal injuries that cause a swift death. If an explosion occurs, it's more likely that passengers will die before the actual crash. However, an explosion would mean a death that was rapid and pain-free. If the plane doesn't explode and continues to plummet, it's likely the spine will break and separate the nerves from your brain, causing you to die instantly. A 1950 crash in London found that the injuries the victims sustained, including fractured skulls, spines, ruptured hearts, and more, caused immediate loss of consciousness or death. The same was found for victims of a 2009 Air France flight, as investigators concluded that any pain felt from the trauma was brief and death was quick. Its terrifying descent into the Atlantic Ocean took just four minutes. However, if you crash during takeoff or landing, the chances of surviving are higher than 50%. Additionally, it's important to remember that traveling by plane is safer than other modes of transportation like driving or cycling. Knowing this and other facts regarding plane crashes might help ease flight anxiety. Even though the survival rate for plane crashes is quite high, this doesn't mean a person comes out unscathed if an accident does occur. And it just all happened too fast. Plenty of people have survived plane crashes, although some did so with severe injuries. 
According to The Guardian, Michelle Dusan was only six years old in 1995 when she survived a plane crash that killed 151 people, including her mother, brother, and cousin. American Airlines Flight 965 crashed in a mountain in Colombia, and Dusan and her father were two of four survivors. Dusan sustained injuries to her legs and was in a wheelchair for years. She was told she would never walk again, but beat the odds. She still has seatbelt marks on her legs. On Christmas Eve 1971, 17-year-old Juliana Kopka and her mother were flying over the Peruvian rainforest when the plane was hit by lightning. She suddenly found herself flying through the air while still strapped into her seat. She broke her collarbone, had deep cuts, and ruptured a ligament in her knee, but survived. She was alone in the rainforest for 11 days before she was found. Kopka's mother's body was later discovered. She too had survived the crash, but was too injured to move and died days later. According to Insider, there are several ways to increase your chance of surviving if a plane crash does occur. These include choosing a middle seat in the back rows, bracing for impact, and wearing tight-fitting clothing. Cremation is an increasingly popular way to dispose of a loved one's remains after death, but it's actually a more complex process than you might think. Here's what happens to a body when it's cremated. Ironically, a body's journey towards cremation begins with a trip to the refrigerator. Crematories nowadays have special rooms maintained at low temperatures. This is where the body of the deceased stays while they're not yet lined up for cremation. When it's time, the staff retrieve the remains from the refrigerated room in preparation for identification. Prior to identification, staffers give the deceased one final bath to ensure that the body is clean and well-dressed, though unless the cremation will be open to the public or the family specifically asks for it, the deceased will not undergo embalming. The cremation process officially kicks off with a medical examiner properly identifying the body, typically with assistance from a relative of the deceased. The body receives a metal ID tag, which will remain there during the cremation. The family member also authorizes the cremation process. Meanwhile, it's the examiner's job to confirm that the body isn't vital in any pending investigations, as medical exams obviously won't be possible post-cremation. Depending on where the cremation is taking place, the next step in the process is usually the removal of jewelry, prosthetics, eyeglasses, medical devices, and other accessories from the body. Among the first things the technician removes are so-called cancer seeds. If the deceased was undergoing treatment for cancer while they were still alive, chances are the technician will find some radioactive isotopes implanted in their body. Prosthetics and silicone implants also don't stay on the body because they could result in some unpleasant reactions during the cremation process. Additionally, the crematory technician takes items from the body that the bereaved would like to hold on to. However, the technician doesn't remove any pins, screws, or replacement joints from the deceased. Any items that don't end up in the family's hands undergo recycling or proper disposal but are never directly reused. A notoriously dangerous item to leave on a soon-to-be cremated corpse is an artificial pacemaker. Cambridgeshire Live reports that a forgotten pacemaker can generate an explosion powerful enough to send a 40-ton crematory machine flying up to 7 inches off the ground. A paper in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine reveals that the first recorded incident of a pacemaker accident during a cremation took place in 1976, resulting in five explosions and a half-inch sized hole in the machine. While the final destination of a person's cremated remains could eventually be inside an urn or scattered across a significant location, before cremation, the body is first placed in a cremation casket. According to Neptune Society, the family has the option to purchase either a traditional casket or a combustible one, with the only requirement being that the casket must be devoid of metal pieces. A combustible casket is usually the choice for families who plan to hold a religious service or make the cremation viewable to the public. As the name suggests, these metal-free coffins are made of bamboo, cloth-covered wood, hardwood, teak, wicker, plywood, pine, or any other combustible material. Even a cardboard box could suffice. When it's time, the staff wheel the casket into a machine called a cremation chamber or retort, but never an oven. Technicians preheat the incinerator to about 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. During the process itself, temperatures can reach up to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. Designed to accommodate a single body, the chamber is lined with fire-resistant bricks that can withstand the heat beyond the hottest temperatures within. For safety reasons, technicians only open the mechanized automated doors just enough to let the body slide safely in without subjecting the room to unbearable heat. Today's cremation chambers also adhere strictly to state environmental regulations. The cremation process generates gases and particles, which is why there's a secondary chamber that sucks them in and takes them through a 30-foot labyrinth of sorts, while subjecting them to flames up to 1700 degrees Fahrenheit. By the end of the maze, most of the gases will have already been incinerated before they can even reach the atmosphere. 
Depending on the arrangement or the religious beliefs of the family, the bereaved may start the cremation process by pressing a button, and then science takes over. About three-fourths of the human body is water. During the cremation, all of that moisture is the first to go, and the body dries up as the heat in the chamber intensifies. The entire process is a mix of melodramatic and macabre. Body hairs burn up, skin waxes, welts, and splits as it burns. The muscles flex one last time as the scorching heat causes them to contract. The soft tissues melt into nothingness, and the skeleton? That breaks down bit by bit, calcifying and crumbling as the chamber torches the remains. Eerily, because the secondary chamber deals with the resulting gases and particles before they can make it out, the burning body typically generates no smell. This also prevents any mercury, such as from dental amalgam fillings, from escaping the chamber. In some cases, crematoriums use the heat generated by the entire process for warmth, a practical use of all that energy, considering how some can cremate up to 3,000 bodies yearly. Even with the metal tag and precautionary guidelines in place, the fear of a crematory mix-up, whether it involves the wrong body getting cremated or a family receiving the wrong ashes, is ever-present. However, cremations are done separately, one body at a time, to greatly minimize the risk of any of these unfortunate events happening. Still, the unthinkable has happened on rare occasions. In 2018, for instance, a woman in Texas was supposed to be buried but was accidentally cremated instead. And in 2015, a family was sent the ashes of an unknown stranger rather than their family member. So how long does it take to cremate a body? The answer is essentially, it depends. Various factors affect the duration of the process, such as the type and quality of the cremation equipment and chamber, as well as the nature of the cremation casket. The weight of the deceased is another important consideration. The heat inside the chamber burns fat rather quickly, yet an obese body can take longer to cremate and in some cases can generate more gases and particles than the after chamber can handle. It's safe to say that a typical cremation can last from 60 minutes to 3 hours, though most take between 90 and 120 minutes. The staff can check the status of the cremated body through a spy hole, but only when the chamber isn't firing off pillars of flames. Interestingly enough, the word ashes is a bit of a misnomer. Despite spending hours getting blasted by extreme heat, the body that went into the cremation chamber doesn't come out of it looking like a pile of ash. While ashes is the more commonly used term, it's more accurate to call them cremains, because that's precisely what they are. The cremated remains of bones that have turned coarse and grayish instead of powder-like. As you can imagine, the resulting cremains are piping hot, making them unsafe to handle with bare hands. Technicians use a long rod, like a farmer's rake or hoe, to gather them up, putting them in a separate container and leaving them alone until they're cool enough to inspect. By the end of the cremation process, what used to be a human body turns into less than 10 pounds worth of cremains. After some time, the technician inspects the cooled cremains for any remaining scraps of metal from dental or surgical implants. These technicians use forceps and strong magnets to make the metal elimination process easier. After stripping the cremains of metal, the metal is sent off to be recycled or disposed of following state regulations. It's important to separate the leftover metal from the cremains, as those bits can cause problems in the next part of the process. The cremains undergo one more step before the crematory prepares to send them back to the family of the deceased. It's time to pulverize the little chunks and fragments of dried bone into sand-like particles. To accomplish this, technicians use a machine called a cremulator, which is sort of a high-powered grinder or blender that quickly pulverizes the bone fragments using ball bearings or sharp rotating blades. After the deceased has been cremated, there are a number of options that the bereaved can pick to serve as their loved one's final resting place. However, this isn't an instantaneous process. According to Lincoln Heritage, it may take anywhere between a week and 10 days before the crematory finishes preparing the cremains for the family, depending on their internal policies. By far, one of the most popular options is a cremation urn. The staff places a plastic bag containing the ashes into the urn, which they then hand over to the family. The family can either purchase the urn directly from the crematory or buy from a different source. Urns don't necessarily have to look plain and undecorated, though. You can get designer urns that come in every shape possible, from an urn with a famous dictator's face on it to a Star Trek-inspired container. The urn. It's the only place. Sometimes, families may go for more personalized or unique ways of storing cremains. Some opt to bury the urn or position it under a significant spot like a sculpture or a tree. Others place the cremains inside pendants or lockets so that they can take their dearly departed with them wherever they travel. There are even family members who opt to compress the carbon-rich cremains into cremation diamonds. For some folks, the idea of having their ashes scattered across the ocean or all over their favorite spot is the truest form of returning to nature. 
As romantic as it may seem in books and movies, however, it's not something your loved ones can easily do for you someday. In fact, it's illegal in quite a few places, and if your loved ones get caught, your final resting place will most likely be a landfill. Unsurprisingly, amusement parks are at the top of the list of places where it's illegal to scatter ashes. According to a 2018 article in the Wall Street Journal, a HEPA cleanup immediately follows any attempt to scatter cremains in Disney parks, which, according to employees, is apparently a monthly thing. If you and your deceased loved one were fans of Mickey Mouse, getting caught would probably be the worst thing for both of you. The cremains would end up in the trash, and you'll get kicked out of the happiest place on Earth. If you insist on disposing your loved ones in a theme park, take them over to Busch Gardens, because anything goes over there. Other places where you can't scatter ashes? Golf courses, sports stadiums, or any kind of private property. If it's any consolation, you can send your loved one's ashes into outer space, though it'll cost you between $2,500 and $12,500, a cost that not everyone wants to pay. We're scattering the f***ing ashes, but just because we're bereaved doesn't make us sad! As mentioned earlier, the cremation process ends up generating large quantities of gas and particles. And while the afterchamber exists to deal with this, according to CNN, it's not always enough, especially with the rising number of cremations. So it's not surprising that experts have been working to come up with a more environmentally friendly alternative. According to Popular Mechanics, alkaline hydrolysis, also called liquid cremation, started out as a means of disposing of infected animal carcasses. The operator heats up a stainless steel pressurized chamber full of water and potassium hydroxide to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Within three hours, it can turn a body into a goopy greenish-brown liquid, leaving only softened bones and non-organic matter behind. A fortuitous side effect of this process, particularly from the perspective of human cremation, is that it generates fewer pollutants, including reduced carbon monoxide. Alkaline hydrolysis seems like a fantastic alternative to modern cremation, but there are some downsides to it. For starters, it's a lot more expensive. Crematories can expect to spend up to a cool $500,000 for the chamber, which is five times what a basic cremation chamber costs. The process also takes longer than cremation, up to 16 hours according to the Cremation Association of North America. And for now, it's illegal in many states. Video games are awesome, everyone knows that. But what the heck happens to your puny body when you play an excessive amount of them? There are cases from all over the world of gamers playing too much for too long and not surviving to actually reach the end credits. But despite a few tragic tales of gaming gone wrong, video games aren't all bad. There are plenty of ways that video games can actually make you a better person, and a few ways that they can turn you into a useless husk of a human. So let's dig into the good, the bad, and the ugly of going into the deep end of video gaming. Bloodborne. Marathon gaming sessions aren't uncommon, but all of those all-night kill streaks might be endangering your life. A condition called deep vein thrombosis can result from frequently sitting still for too long. One British gamer died of blood clots formed by a lifestyle of frequent 12-hour gaming sessions, and he's not the only gamer that's damaged their circulation system by prolonged immobility. Deep vein thrombosis, sometimes known as economy class syndrome, typically affects travelers of extremely long-haul flights, since there's nowhere to move around, and involves the formation of blood clots due to extended periods of sitting in one place. Your body needs to move, so don't be afraid to hit pause or skip a match. You have the rest of your life to get fragged, but this isn't the only reason to get up while you get your game on. Fat Princess For a while, motion gaming platforms like Nintendo Wii and PlayStation Move were starting to push the boundaries as far as what it meant to play a video game, but for the most part, gaming is still defined by kicking back on the couch and pushing buttons. Turns out that sitting around for hours on end with minimal movement can make you fat. Who knew? Studies have shown largely mixed results. Some say that active video games don't really have a negative effect on your body as long as you keep your hands off the snacks while you're sitting there. Other studies have found that those who play video games a lot are more likely to gain weight. No matter what, playing button mashers is not a net positive for your bot. The best approach? Try to mix in a little exercise and healthy snacks every few levels. Nintendonitis even if you keep your body active between gaming sessions, the repetition of using a controller for weeks on end can still take a toll. Gaming typically requires a lot of repetitive hand motions, and tons of players have developed repetitive stress injuries thanks to gaming. The condition happens when you repeatedly do the same motion over and over, and typically affects the wrists and hands, but can move up to the forearms and elbows depending on the person and the playing style. You're not even safe if you're famous or using a non-traditional controller. Injury-prone MLB pitcher Joel Zumaya was sidelined by playing Guitar Hero 2 a little too hard and messing up his wrist. In other words, put the controller down sometimes. Brain drain. 
If you play video games enough, they can start to mess with your mind, literally. A 2011 study published in Translational Psychiatry surveyed brain scans of 154 14-year-old children who played more than 9 hours of video games each week. Hardcore gamers had much larger reward centers in their brains than the average kid, which prompted the desire to play even more video games. And if you're prone to seizures, you need to be very careful with your gaming sessions. A report published by the National Institutes of Health in 1994 noted a study in which the majority of patients with epileptic seizures suffered from photosensitivity while playing video games. For 27 of the 35 seizure patients studied, their first seizure came while playing video games. Since 1994, however, there have been standards put in place to prevent unnecessary photostimulation in video games. That doesn't mean that every game publisher follows those rules, however, so proceed with caution. Of course, it's not all bad news. Let's talk a little bit about mind powers. According to a 2013 study at the Max Planck Institute, areas in the brain responsible for spatial navigation, memory formation, and strategic planning could all be positively impacted by video games. Looking beyond just those perks, the study noted that there could be great potential in using video games as a form of therapy for patients who suffer from mental disorders, ranging from Alzheimer's to schizophrenia. And when it comes to getting your hands to match your brain, there's more good news. You usually have to be fast to be a good gamer, and not surprisingly, those skills can translate beyond video games. In 2014, tech Times reported on a study that found playing action video games helped gamers learn new motor skills, as well as develop their eye and hand coordination. Career-wise, the report notes those abilities can come in handy if you want to be a surgeon, so remember that the next time you're flying through Halo, you're also prepping for med school. Can't get enough. Douglas Gentile, a psychologist at Iowa State University, has been tracking video game players for decades. According to his findings, about 9% of kids who play video games are addicted. So what's the cause of the video game addiction? Gentile broke it down to what he calls the ABCs. The A is autonomy. We like to feel we're in control. B is belonging. We like to feel connected to other people. And C is competence. We like to feel that we're good at what we do. Psychologist Mark Griffiths, director of the International Gaming Research Unit at Nottingham Trent University, added that the addiction can also be related to the constant rewards built into video games, from hitting high scores to merely the sense of accomplishment. Those game achievements you're striving for? They're totally playing you, bro. Social Network the sweaty loner sitting in his room playing video games in the dark is an old cliché, and these days, it's actually an outdated one. Online gaming has managed to connect people in ways we never could have dreamed of decades ago, and it's actually helping potential solitary players find new friends. According to a 2013 report by the American Psychological Association, more than 70% of gamers play with at least one friend, and millions of people have joined virtual worlds through social games, from Farmville to World of Warcraft. These types of games encourage cooperation and teamwork, and considering the typical Warcraft player logs more than 22 hours per week online, it stands to reason that most players would find a camaraderie there. Along with virtual friends, video games are also popular among real-life pals to throw down online. And that's pretty undeniably awesome. You know what you guys should do? What? Try being around other humans well, every oh. once in a while, because oh. humans don't bug like this. With its rancid toothpaste taste and alcoholic burn, mouthwash lets you know that it means business. When it enters your mouth, it doesn't care about being your friend. The stuff is essentially a pesticide for mouth cooties, and it kills germs so effectively it might even kill the gonorrhea bacteria living in your throat. Live Science writes that as early as 1879, Listerine was touted as a cure for gonorrhea, which can, in fact, cause a sore throat and swollen lymph nodes. But while the killing ability of mouthwash makes it a useful way to rid your throat of tainted love and stave off tooth decay, you might also wonder how toxic it would be if you swallowed some after swishing. The American Dental Association explains that there are two main types of mouthwash, therapeutic and cosmetic. Therapeutic mouthwash combats bad breath, cavities, gingivitis, and the plaque plaguing your mouth. Cosmetic mouthwash, meanwhile, masks your bad breath without attacking the root cause of your future root canal. Since both versions are mouthwashes, not mouth drinks, they contain substances that can damage your internal organs. Cosmetic mouthwash, for example, may contain peroxide, which you shouldn't drink. Luckily, ADA-approved mouthwashes have been tested for safety, which means that swallowing small quantities should not be deadly. Crest warns that swallowing small amounts of mouthwash may leave you feeling a bit queasy or may even cause diarrhea. But after a while, those symptoms should pass. However, to ensure that small kids don't have to endure that discomfort, children under age 6 shouldn't use mouthwash, while kids from ages 6 to 12 should only use it with adult supervision. While mouthwash ingested in small doses doesn't warrant alarm, this stuff can and has killed people. According to a report by the South Florida Sun Sentinel, between 1984 and 1993, there were three documented cases of children killed by mouthwash. 
All were under five years old and died from the high concentrations of alcohol typical of mouthwash. Registered Dental Hygienist magazine notes that Listerine's original formula is 26.9% alcohol, while other flavored mouthwashes may be 22% alcohol. Scope is slightly lower at 18.9%, and Sepacol is 14% alcohol. With alcohol concentrations that high, young children aren't the only people at risk of alcohol poisoning. In 2003, a 45-year-old man died after drinking nearly 3 liters of mouthwash. According to Michael's House Treatment Centers, a quartet of toxic substances can be found in most brands of mouthwash. Even the ethanol in mouthwash isn't fit for consumption and can cause blood toxicity or an overdose. Methyl salicylate gives mouthwash its minty flavor but can give you, quote, rapid onset salicylate poisoning which the Emergency Medicine Journal says is potentially lethal. Another common ingredient is hydrogen peroxide, which can inflict gastrointestinal damage that causes discomfort, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Chlorohexidine gluconate can interfere with circulation, raises blood pressure, and harm the heart. It also kills the bacteria that suppress blood pressure spikes. However, all those dangers haven't always stopped struggling alcoholics from using the product for its alcoholic properties. And mouthwash isn't the only example. In Russia, lack of access to liquor has driven some people to ingest a bevy of non-beverages. As reported by Time in 2016, at least 58 people died in Siberia from consuming a bath lotion with a high concentration of alcohol. An analysis found that up to 12 million Russians imbibed toxic substitutes for alcohol, including window cleaner, antifreeze, aftershave, and perfume. In Canada, struggling alcoholics have been known to consume hand sanitizer, rubbing alcohol, and hairspray, according to Vice. In addition to the risk of poisoning, the consistency of some substances may make them dangerously hard to swallow. Hand sanitizer poses a choking hazard that killed at least one Canadian who had joined a group devoted to kicking such deadly drinking habits. Sadly, desperate times can drive people to deadly measures. To put it simply, it is dangerous to drink mouthwash. If you suspect that you or someone else may be at risk of mouthwash poisoning, contact the National Poison Control Center at 1-800-222-1222. Ever been tempted to touch lava? Probably not, but here's what would happen if you did. Newsflash, people, if a volcano is going to erupt, don't be nearby. Just ask the folks on La Palma, the northwesternmost Canary Island off the west coast of Morocco. In 2021, La Palma's volcano erupted for months straight, coating the landscape and homes in lava, suffocating the island in ash, spilling molten rock into the ocean, and generally ruining the lives of the island's 80,000 inhabitants. The police came, we had to go, we had to go, we had to go, and um, we left everything. Shockingly, no one was killed or injured. The Spanish government has since allocated 225 million euros to the island's recovery. Such horrors aren't anything remotely new when it comes to volcanoes, however. The ancient Roman city of Pompeii provides us with the clearest, most well-preserved example of what can happen to people caught in the aftermath of a volcanic eruption. In 79 CE, Mount Vesuvius spewed out enough ash to bury the entire city of Pompeii. It wouldn't be rediscovered for over 1,500 years. Vesuvius's destruction was so rapid and thorough that the remains of Pompeii 12,000 inhabitants were encased in death poses, and many can still be seen today. Volcanoes are a perfect example of the fragility of human bodies, lives, and civilizations. They're also just another natural geological phenomenon that have, along with earthquakes, formed the very ground we step on. But for the living, volcanoes spell pain, death, and destruction in any number of ways. If you were standing face to face with a caldera's bubbling cauldron when it started to drop flecks of 2,120 degree lava past your head, you'd freak out, and you'd be right to do so. But if those flecks started to geyser or even ooze, well, how fast can you run? Because if it's not faster than a 30 mile per hour lava flow, you're going to be consumed from the feet up right down to the bone. And yet thousands of tourists flock to get glimpses of active volcanoes every year. Of course, it's worth knowing that one touch from lava wouldn't instantly dissolve your flesh. You'd probably get a nasty burn, but further injuries would depend on the amount of lava coverage and the length of contact with your skin. Lava starts to cool when it's expelled and develops a hard outer skin that can trap things inside, so you don't want to be touching it for too long. Meanwhile, fully-fledged lava flows basically devour everything in their path, and the ramifications of such devastation can far outweigh the destruction of direct contact with lava. And then there's the ash. When folks think of ash, they're usually envisioning combustive ash, the soft, powdery stuff left behind when you burn something. It's made of calcium carbonate, nitrogen, potash, and minerals and oxides. Volcanic ash, on the other hand, is composed of coarse, rough 
rough little chips of whatever stony materials get blasted out of the earth during an eruption. It's insoluble, meaning it doesn't dissolve in contact with water, and therefore can't be washed away. Ashfall, as it's called, has to be scooped up bit by bit and properly disposed of. Humans caught in ashfall can develop chronic breathing and throat problems. This is especially true if someone already has a lung disorder like asthma. In fact, the American Lung Association advises assuming that your lung condition may deteriorate and lists several do's and don'ts for those caught in an eruption. This includes staying inside and not relying on masks for complete protection. Volcanic ash can also cause inflammation, lung fibrosis, and even cancer because the silicates you inhale become stuck in your lungs. And volcanic eruptions can have far more serious, far-reaching consequences on human life beyond the initial eruption. In fact, some volcanic eruptions can be so strong and so severe that they alter the Earth's climate. Most of the ash shot into the atmosphere falls to the ground within days, maybe weeks. But gases released into the stratosphere? Not so much. Of all the gases released from the guts of the planet during a volcanic eruption, two can have powerful and contradictory effects on Earth's climate. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that heats up the atmosphere, compounding problems such as global warming. Sulfur dioxide condenses into a fine mist that reflects sunlight and decreases Earth's temperature. Plus, the shorter-term cloak of gray sky ash can reduce the Earth's temperature even further. This might affect crop yields on an annual basis, which is trouble enough for many people. But what if enough volcanoes go off or spark particularly severe eruptions? There is a much more serious risk, not only to our life and civilization, but to all planetary life. If you hold in a fart, does it eventually make its way out? Here's the beans on your flatulence fate, if you don't let her rip. Before we can know what held in farts do to your insides, we have to really understand what a fart even is. According to Medical News Daily, farts are a mix of gases that get into our digestive tract through a number of different mechanisms and which are then forced out of our anuses. Some of that gas is simple atmospheric air swallowed while eating, drinking, sucking on a straw, chewing gum, or smoking. Other gases, such as the hydrogen sulfide gas that gives our flatulence its signature smell, comes from the digestive process itself. Chemical interactions between food and digestive juices release gases as a byproduct when our dinner is broken down into absorbable nutrients. Our gut bacteria plays a role too, adding their own little farts onto our bigger farts while they do their beneficial work, breaking down excess starches. Of course, that's just our normal farts. Some farts are the result of medical disorders and food intolerance, but even those things tend to produce farts of a similar design, but in higher quantities and with different gas ratios. And the quantity of farts does vary from person to person. According to Healthline, the average person cuts the cheese between 5 and 15 times each and every day. Dr. Svetong Desai from the Medical Center at Duke University says that averages out to between half a liter and one and a half liters of intestinal gas each day. That's a lot of farting to hold in, and when we do hold it in, that gas still needs to go somewhere. Typically, it makes its way back through the intestines to where it came from, but it doesn't stay there. According to Newsweek, your trapped farts will likely find a way out of your body via one orifice or another, either by working through the large and small intestines up past the stomach and out of your mouth in the form of a slightly less offensive burp, or by overpowering our final sphincters and forcing the fart out through the back door. Good deal. A romantic night in a wienermobile. <laughs> what? Sorry. Best case scenario, the farts might escape at night while you're sleeping. At least then, only you and your partner might be offended, and hopefully, you'll just sleep through it. Still, there can be ramifications for holding your farts in all day. According to Seeker, if the gas can't escape, some of it will be absorbed through the intestinal wall and into your bloodstream, causing belly pain, discomfort, and obnoxious bloating. That's the typical outcome when you hold in a fart. But preventing gas from escaping regularly or having certain medical conditions can turn a held-in fart into something much more dangerous. First, and probably the scariest of the dangerous things that can happen when you hold in your farts, is that you might explode. Don't worry too much, as this is extremely unlikely. But it can actually be serious. According to What If, if you have an intestinal blockage that physically prevents your farts from being released, it is possible that the gas will build up and expand your intestines like an overinflated balloon animal until, pop, they burst. This isn't something that's likely to happen to you, though. It's an extremely rare occurrence that usually only affects already ill patients. What's more likely to happen is less extreme, but still very unpleasant. According to the conversation, repeated holding in of farts can lead to a condition known as diverticulitis. This condition causes your gut to develop pouches that get swollen and inflamed and generally just muck up the digestive process. The symptoms can be fairly unpleasant. According to the Mayo Clinic, these can include anything from severe abdominal pain to vomiting, constipation, or diarrhea. 
fever, and of course, rectal bleeding. It can also lead to further complications in the case of infection. So the best thing you can do is just to let her rip. Your friends and colleagues may not thank you, but your body will. You may think you know what happens after you die, but there are a lot of shocking post-mortem possibilities you might not expect. From perfectly normal to downright bizarre, these things really can happen to your body after you die. Movies often make death look quick. Dying characters might rasp words emphatically or wordlessly gasp dramatically in their final moments. Oh my. But once they die, they basically become paperweights. Real corpses, on the other hand, sometimes cling to life long after they're officially lifeless. Their brains are dead, yet their hearts and other organs seem to function unencumbered. Without a working brainstem, breathing and other body functions should stop. However, in the 1950s, physicians began noticing that some of the patients they deemed alive were actually brain dead, and such cases became known as beating heart cadavers. And this phenomenon has nothing to do with the advent of ventilators or other medical devices. Long before such life support devices existed, flummoxed physicians learned that certain patients' hearts pumped for hours after death. While these occurrences are rare, UCLA neurologist Alan Schumann dug up 175 separate examples of bodies whose functions kept going for more than a week after death. One corpse reportedly functioned for two decades, so rather than resting in peace once you die, pieces of you may stubbornly insist on living. Mortality can hinge on seconds. If your heart stops long enough, so does the rest of you. So once your ticker quits, death generally comes quickly, but not always. He says he's not dead. Yes, he is. I'm not. He isn't? Well, he will be soon. He's very ill. I'm getting better. No, you're not. You'll be stone dead in a moment. For example, there was 78-year-old Walter Williams, who had seemingly breathed his last breath on a Wednesday night in March 2014. The coroner says he checked the pulse around 9 o'clock Wednesday night and pronounced Williams dead at his home in Lexington with no heartbeat. But Williams had a surprise up his sleeve. Evidently unimpressed with death, he started writhing in his body bag. The best guess is that William's heart somehow restarted because of a defibrillator he had implanted in his chest. And at 2.30, my cousin called me and said, not yet. I said, what you mean, not yet? He said, Dad is still here. Williams might have had help from hidden jumper cables, but some resurrections can't be explained as easily. In 2013, ABC recounted the unlikely revival of 37-year-old Anthony Yali. There was no uh, spontaneous blood pressure or pulse. And with very heavy hearts, we had to uh, stop and uh, we pronounced him actually dead. Yali's heart stopped for a total of 45 minutes. But just when it seemed that the Reaper had completed another harvest, Yali returned to the land of the living without explanation. Even if your heart doesn't go on like the theme from Titanic, your deceased body might still show signs of afterlife. For instance, your brain may remain functional long enough to realize that you died. A survey of over 2,000 cardiac arrest survivors conducted by the Stony Brook University School of Medicine suggested that people who come back from the great beyond can sometimes recall resuscitation. In other words, multiple patients who technically passed away stayed awake after their fate was apparently sealed. To clarify, these weren't people whose hearts simply took an extended break from beating. All signs of life as we recognized them had ceased. Regardless, temporary corpses could vividly remember the measures taken to rescue them. This raises unsettling questions about what it means to die. What if some supposed stiffs are only mostly dead? While all these rare occurrences may make death seem like an illusion, decomposition shows otherwise. Not all decaying bodies become compost, though. Through the magic of morbid chemistry, some corpses turn into soap. Cadaver fat sometimes interacts with bacteria during a process called saponification. The result is a soap-like or waxy substance called a diposere that envelops the body and allows human remains to remain relatively intact as a kind of soap mummy. Rather than merely rotting, your corpse could become a cleaning product or candle wax, which, according to Scientific American, actually happened in 18th century France. When corpses rot, they also cool down, except for when they don't. In numerous harrowing instances throughout history, rather than losing heat, the departed actually get warmer. The phenomenon is called postmortem hyperthermia, and no one's been able to explain it. Old-timey physicians used to fear that sudden temperature spikes in corpses would lead to spontaneous combustion. It didn't happen, but science still hasn't figured out the cause of the rare corpse warmth. Neither the room temperature nor the cadaver's state of dress seem to be factors. 
Certain internal stressors like drug use and trauma might play a role, but if so, then no one knows exactly how. Some theorize it could have something to do with the bacteria left in the body after death, but so far, no one's been able to prove anything. All we know for sure is that when it comes to death, some like it hot. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If you're hoping to preserve the body of your favorite loved one, coffins and embalming fluid are the last things you should trust. Death isn't just the ultimate existential dilemma, it's also a logistical problem, from the living's perspective. Throughout human history, we've struggled to find the best possible ways to respectfully dispose of our deceased loved ones' bodies, while adhering to the religious belief systems that define our respective cultures. For instance, early Vikings often relied on funeral pyres to properly send the dead on their way to the afterlife, according to history. They were also known to place the deceased in ships and push them out to sea before setting them ablaze with flaming arrows, but this was usually reserved for chieftains and other high-ranking individuals. Either way, it was believed that the smoke from the fire was the vessel that would deliver their souls to the other side, be it Valhalla for warriors who died in battle, or Hell for those who died of sickness or old age. Ancient Egyptians used complex methods of mummification to preserve their pharaohs, believing that this process, coupled with extravagant rituals, was the only way for them to reach the Field of Reeds. According to the World History Encyclopedia, it was believed that the physical body was a necessary component of the afterlife. In a practice that goes back 11,000 years and still occurs today, people of Tibet partake in sky burials, which involve the body first being dismembered by a burial master and then taken to a highly elevated area where vultures consume the remains, according to Emory University. In modern societies, you might think that the practice of burying our loved ones in a coffin is the most popular method. However, this is not the case, at least in America. That, that is not my future. I'm not going to be buried in a grave. Choice Mutual did a survey and found that cremation is what most people desire, with 44% leaning towards this option. Nonetheless, traditional burials still come in second, with 35% preferring to rest for eternity in a coffin six feet underground. While we can't make any scientific confirmation of a soul or what happens to your consciousness after you pass away, we do know quite well what happens to the body after it's been left to do its thing for decades. In short, it turns into the dust and dirt from which it came, and there's a timeline for how it all goes down. Once a body's been laying in the coffin for 50 years, there's really not much of it left. The process of human decomposition starts almost immediately after death and leaves an unrecognizable lump of desiccated flesh within days or weeks of demise. But what about embalmment, you might ask? Unfortunately, this doesn't have a particularly long-lasting effect. According to the funeral source, your typical mortuary embalming helps the corpse avoid the bloating stage and keeps it looking fresh for a few days to a week tops, just long enough for family to pay their respects. After that, it's back to decomposition as usual. It does slow the process down a little, but only by about 5 to 10 years, according to Live Science. Per The Guardian, the first thing to go when a body starts to decompose is the digestive tract. All the helpful bacteria the gut previously used for digestion no longer has an immune system to keep it in check, so it multiplies, spreads, and feeds on all of the body's internal organs, starting with the intestines. Eventually, it works its way outwards and devours everything in its path. As Business Insider points out, the only things still hanging about after a half century are bones and a bit of skin. The skin isn't really skin after this long either. It's dried out and wrapped nicely around the skeleton like a mummified cocoon. Thanks to the heavy load of strong fibrous collagen that makes up the dermis and other structures like tendons and ligaments, the remains aren't just a bleached lump of bones. Instead, they're a picturesque bouquet of desiccated horror suitable for the most terrifying of nightmares. But don't let that worry you. Even that won't last for too much longer. Eventually, the little that remains of a body will return to the earth and revert to soil to nurture new life for years to come. It's not so bad when you put it that way, is it? So, you want to donate your body to science. Or, more accurately, science wants you to donate your body to science. Because let's face it, donating your body to science might sound like an awesome idea, but do you really know what happens if you do? Here are all the different things your body could be doing after you die. Loved ones who care about what happens to your remains after you've been shuffled off may experience varying degrees of horror knowing the ultimate fate of your body, how long it remains out there in the hands of science, and whether or not they'll ever be able to give it a proper burial. You get to decide all that stuff in advance, though, which will hopefully make it easier for your family to stomach. In the UK, for example, you have a couple of different options. You can give what's called indefinite consent, which means whoever gets your body can keep it for as long as they need it. You can also permit short-term use of a few months, after which your body goes back to your family. Some contracts let the school or facility keep body parts indefinitely, which is cool as long as you don't spend too much time wondering which body parts. The consent you give is probably going to depend as much on what your family wants as what you want. 
For some people, a body is just an empty shell, while for others, it's still connected to the person who once owned it, making saying goodbye difficult or even impossible without it. So it's probably smart to discuss your decision with your family, just so they're not blindsided when the inevitable finally happens. If there's anything awesome about death, it's the fact that you don't have to impress anyone to get there. Death is non-discriminatory. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Sir. Unless you're donating your body to science. Yep, scientists don't just accept any corpse, and most people don't qualify to become a medical science cadaver. Up to 70% of those who apply to BioGift Anatomical, for example, get rejected before they've even died. I didn't get in. To earn the privilege of being posthumously cut up into little pieces, you must first answer an extensive list of questions about your health and social life. Most whole-body donation centers will exclude people who have communicable diseases like HIV and hepatitis, but you may also get the post-mortem boot if you're overweight. And just because you get into the program while you're still living doesn't mean they'll take you after you die. Sometimes your manner of death excludes you. If you had to be autopsied, for example, you're no good to medical students. And if you've had traumatic injuries because of a particularly violent car accident, you'll probably be excluded too. Some who donate their bodies to science might not think too much about what specifically could happen to their remains. It's enough to just check a couple of boxes on your organ donor card and leave the rest to the scientists. If you choose research and education, there's a pretty good chance you'll end up on a cold metal table in a classroom attended by first-year medical students. Disassembling a corpse is something every medical student can expect to do early in the educational process. And with roughly 20,000 new doctors graduating med school every single year, the demand for willing dead people is especially high. It's still hard to think about since your body currently belongs to you and the idea of it being cut into bits by a bunch of awkward students is sort of horrifying. So it may comfort you to know that most schools teach respect along with anatomy. At Stanford, for example, students are asked to participate in a moment of silence to honor the lives of the people on the examining tables. Suppose you've always been sort of claustrophobic. The idea of a coffin gives you anxiety, and you don't like fire very much either. Or maybe you just think nature intended for corpses to decompose out in the open air. Your family would probably get in trouble for abandoning your corpse at a national park, but that's not the only way. A body farm will grant you your wish of natural decomposition as long as you let them study your rotting corpse over a period of weeks in the name of science. The University of Tennessee's Body Farm, a 2.5-acre outdoor laboratory, is a temporary resting place for around 150 corpses, some fresh, some skeletal, some horrifically in between. Some bodies are in water, some are in the sun, and some are stuffed in the trunks of old cars. People donate their body to science, end up submerged in a pond, crammed in a car. What's the point of all this, besides helping Body Farm earn the title of creepiest place in the universe? Forensic scientists can use the information to build decomposition timelines for bodies that have been left in different conditions. That information can point to a time of death and help solve murders. So your choice to decompose all natural is not just a zen, one-with-the-earth decision. It's also a way for you to fight crime after death. Some people donate their bodies to science specifically for the purpose of becoming skeletons, which is actually pretty cool when you think about it. It's kind of immortality. You'll remain standing for decades after your death, and maybe even longer than that. During that time, you get to gaze creepily at first-year med students. Hopefully, you'll occasionally scare someone who stayed late in the lab one night. Some groups take bodies specifically for the purpose of making them into skeletons. The Maxwell Museum of Anthropology is one such place. Some facilities will take just about anyone, while others are looking for bones that have a more scientific value. The skeletons of cancer patients, for example, can provide valuable insight into bone mastasis, while skeletons with osteoporosis can help scientists discover potential treatments. For the would-be traveler, there are what's known as body brokers, which are kind of like junkyard operators. They pick up dead bodies, disassemble them, and then sell off the parts. Unlike whole body donation centers, a body broker often sells internationally. There's actually a huge market for dead Americans, and there's a pretty simple reason why. Because cadavers are in short supply in nations where customs and traditions dictate what can be done with a dead body. Some cultures insist on treating their members with reverence, but cutting up dead Americans is totally cool. Different institutions are interested in different body parts, which makes selling them piecemeal more practical. What's worse, families don't always understand that their loved ones might be dismembered and sent overseas. And not every body broker is on the up and up, either. 
In early 2018, a body broker named Arthur Rathburn was convicted for selling body parts infected with HIV and hepatitis and keeping them in, quote, grisly, unsanitary conditions. So if you do decide that body brokering is for you, at least try to be selective. If you'd rather travel the world more or less intact, you could consider donating your body to a human body exhibit. Corpses in these fascinating but morbid exhibits are plastinated, which basically just means that fluids are replaced with liquid plastic, a process that maintains the body's natural appearance. Yeah, I don't think anyone will notice, but I think you're gonna need a little bondo on the chin, babe. I gotta get to the hardware store. Plastination was made famous by Gunther von Hagen's Body Worlds, which displays plastinated bodies in various states of looking like they've been flayed alive. Not everyone thinks displaying plastinated human bodies is a great idea, but people on the donor list for plastination seem to think of it as a kind of immortality. It's sort of like being the skeleton in the biology classroom, only you get to stare at people with your actual plastinated eyes instead of the gaping sockets of your empty skull. If you love this idea, you can register to be a donor through the Institute for Plastination, but that's not a guarantee you'll get to be part of the show. The Institute has more than 13,000 registered donors waiting to be immortalized in plastic, and very few openings in their traveling exhibit. Instead, it promises you'll be used for, quote, medical training of doctors, so you might not be a plastinated star or anything, but you'll still get to do some good. Tissue donation is closely related to organ donation, but the difference is tissue can be harvested up to 24 hours after death, while most organs need to be harvested right away because they will rapidly begin to deteriorate when starved of oxygen. Tissue donation can potentially save lives, just like organ donation can. But tissue donation is also big business, which means someone else is going to be profiting off your death. If that sounds kind of unsavory, it's because it is. The tissue industry as a whole is worth about $1 billion annually, and one human body is worth about $80,000 in tissues. So your generous donation of your mortal remains might feel altruistic, but that doesn't mean someone isn't profiting from your death. Worse, there's no guarantee your tissues are going to save someone's child or father. They're just as likely to be used to give someone ultra-luscious lips or fully functioning man bits. You keep your pencil in your pocket. You know what I mean? So you might want to choose your tissue harvesting company carefully. Nonprofits are more likely to treat your body with respect rather than as a gold mine. Most people don't realize that donating your body to science doesn't always mean for medical research. Other industries depend on cadavers too, like the auto industry, for example. Sure, a crash test dummy can tell you a lot about what might happen to a human body in an accident. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. But it can't tell you everything. For that, you need an actual human body. Automakers don't actually procure cadavers to use in their own tests, mostly because that would be really bad press for them. Instead, manufacturers distance themselves from the whole dead body thing by asking universities to do cadaver testing on their behalf. And then they sit around and wring their hands hoping no one will leak a video of a real human getting mushed in their cars. It is important research, and as a human crash test dummy, you do save lives. Maybe not in the same way as an organ donor, but helping automakers build safer cars can indirectly save a lot of people. If becoming a crash test dummy seems too gross and violent, you might want to go out of your way to make sure your corpse doesn't end up in the hands of the military. Why does the military need corpses? Because they need to know if their new boot design will stop soldiers from losing feet if they step on a landmine. And the best way to do that is to make a cadaver step on a landmine. This isn't usually a scenario that will please your family, and the military knows that. Which is probably why some corpses pass through a sort of gray market before arriving at their final destination. According to the Markalis Center for Applied Ethics, that's how some bodies got from the Tulane School of Medicine to the military, which paid roughly $30,000 per body. Tulane wasn't even aware this was happening. It transferred bodies it, quote, couldn't use to a body broker, assuming incorrectly that the bodies would go from there to medical schools. That's not to say the military doesn't obtain most of its corpses legitimately, or that you shouldn't register to be exploded in a landmine simulation if you want to commit yourself to potentially saving soldiers in the line of duty. It's still a noble cause if you can get past the whole exploding thing. Funerals are expensive. A traditional funeral with a burial and a headstone costs between $7,000 and $10,000. Cremation is cheaper, but it will still run you at least $1,500, which is a lot of money for some people. Given those hard realities, it's unsurprising that some people just don't claim their loved ones' bodies. 
Whole body donation is one possible solution to the problem. Some institutions will cremate donor bodies after they've been released and provide a short funeral service, complete with a chaplain at no cost to the family. There won't be any big screen TV with images of the departed on loop or stories from grieving loved ones, but if you think the greater gift is saving your family the expense of all those flowers and a shiny wooden coffin, that's a pretty good reason to donate your body to science. As a society, we love our phones even more than we love each other. They hold our schedules, our contacts, our music, and our lives. But what is all that phone time doing to your body? It turns out, more damage than you think. Weakening your immune system. Basically, your cell phone is covered with bacteria. A study done at the London School of Hygiene concluded that there's more bacteria and germs on a cell phone than on the surface of a public toilet seat. One in six phones tested had fecal matter on them which transfers directly to your hands. According to study co-author Dr. Ron Cutler, people may claim they wash their hands regularly, but the science shows otherwise. But it gets worse. In 2011, 27 scientists from the World Health Organization classified cell phones in the same carcinogenic category as pesticides, gasoline exhaust, burning coal, and dry cleaning chemicals. No amount of Purell can save you if your phone is frying your insides. Messing with your head. Studies show that constantly using your phone can cause antisocial behavior. Researchers at the University of Maryland found that, after using a phone, subjects were less likely to engage with others or volunteer to help a charity. Researcher A.J. Abraham explains, When people use their cell phones, it triggers a feeling of connectedness to other people. It makes people think they are fulfilled in this goal. A study at Kent State found that cell phone users who are on their phone at a high frequency tended to have more anxiety, were far unhappier, and had a lower GPA. In addition, you're more likely to develop depression or insomnia. According to researchers at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, the more you're on your phone, especially later into the evening, the more stress it causes your body and mental health. A pain in the neck. Do you have text neck, headaches, a sore back? According to Kenneth Hanjaraj, Chief of Spine Surgery at New York Spine Surgery and Rehabilitation Medicine, the average head weighs 10 to 12 pounds. But when you look down at your phone, the pressure on your neck is equivalent to 60 pounds. Tex neck can also cause TMJ and early onset arthritis. Han Shiraj says these stresses may lead to early wear, tear, degeneration, and possible surgeries. So stand up straight, just like your mama told you. Brain tumors. Italy's Supreme Court linked one man's brain tumor to his cell phone use. The man who used his cell phone over six hours a day for 12 years for work sued the company and won. The Supreme Court cited a Swedish study by Professor Lennart Hardell, who found that heavy cell phone users develop brain cancer four to five times more often. Hardell also found that even people who use their phones sporadically are at risk. Studies have shown that just 50 minutes of use can alter the brain. So be careful, or you might get a tumor. It's not a tumor. It's not a tumor at all. What did you say? A study done by Dr. Narish Panda of the American Academy of Otolaryngology found that people who had been cell phone users for more than four years and were on their phones for more than an hour a day suffered high-frequency hearing loss and possibly inner ear damage. Panda states that symptoms included a warm sensation, ringing in the ears, or difficulty differentiating between consonants like S, F, T, and Z. Bad for your vision. It turns out constantly staring at the harsh light of your phone screen can definitely affect your peepers. The Vision Council reports that staring at the screen can cause what is called digital eye strain. A shocking 65% of Americans have this syndrome, with symptoms like headaches, irritated eyes, blurred vision, neck and back pain, and eye fatigue. The Council recommends limiting screen time or wearing special computer specs. But hey, it could be worse. I'm ants in my eyes, Johnson! Everything's black! I can't see a thing! And also, I can't feel anything either! Did I mention that? Metal Poisoning since the rise in popularity of smartphones, doctors have seen a spike in patients with allergies, rashes, and contact dermatitis. They've discovered this is caused by the metals phones are made from. A Canadian Medical Journal Association study inspected 22 phone models for the presence of nickel, a common allergen and irritant, and discovered 10 tested positive for the metal. Peace out sperm count. Many believe that cell phones are bad for kids, but it's now believed it could also be bad for having kids. A Cleveland Clinic study has found that cell phones could actually lower a man's sperm count. According to the clinic, 15% of couples are affected by infertility. They studied the effects of electromagnetic waves and the relationship between cell phone usage and male infertility. And it turns out there is a direct link. 
According to the clinic, the decrease in sperm count, motility, viability, and normal morphology is related to the duration of exposure to cell phones. For those trying to have kids or just keeping their boys swimming, storing the phone away from your pants pocket would be the safest bet.